I really sense in this service we need to release our worship to Him. Release our worship to Him. Express our worship to Him. Don't allow your mouth to be shut. Open your mouth wide. Declare Jesus is Lord. Let's rule over the atmosphere and declare the heavens are open in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We declare you are Lord. Every knee bows, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Jesus' name, we have worshipped and we have prayed. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together and praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before we take our seats, I want to ask that you turn around to at least two people, greet them or give them a high five and tell them welcome to the lunch of service in the mighty name of Jesus. Glory to God. Please have your seat. Uh, worship team, may the Lord bless you. Thank you for being a blessing uh, to us always. Um, as we enter into the scriptures, I want to welcome our online viewers that are tuning in to this lunch hour service. I want to declare that you are blessed wherever you are. And I believe God has a word for you in Jesus' name. We are talking about a subject that is very important on the fear of the Lord. And uh, so we are going to continue with that. Uh, we had, um, um, should I call it a break or a disruption uh, yesterday? But we are glad we are back in the house of God. I should not forget to appreciate the pastors that are here uh, with us. Uh, Pastor Eliza is here, and I can see a number of pastors among us. Can we appreciate the men and the women of God uh, that are here? Um, I don't want to repeat again. I've been repeating so much, so today we'll proceed. Amen. And... Um, I believe by now you already understand the, the definition of the fear of God is that we need to be aware of God's holiness and righteousness, but then that will come from the knowledge of who God is. I want to say this, that I believe as a church we are living in a day and age where there is such a deficit of the fear of God. Sometimes when you look at what is going on and our understanding and perception of the things of God, you, you get very scared. And um, sometimes I ask, and I don't know, maybe it's just getting older. You know, when you get old, you begin to have other concerns. And uh, the concern I'm getting is, if this is what it is, what will happen with our children? What is going to happen with the church of the future? Because really, there is no fear of God. But I think that is why the Lord has led us to share this message. So that in a very personal way, we can recover any lost ground that has been lost. So today I want to concentrate on talking about the signs or the indications that there is the fear of God. And this one 
we need to look at it as a measuring stick, a yard stick. We evaluate our lives and uh, we see how are we in, this, in these matters. Again, it's not very hard. That, that's what I like about the word of God. It's not complicated. Even a child can understand. Amen. I always tend to feel like if our preaching cannot be understood by children, then we are not preaching the gospel that Jesus preached. Because the gospel must be so simple, even children rejoice hearing. And so uh, don't be intimidated by that topic, you know, uh, or theme, uh, indicators. How do we know that there's a fear of God? They are very simple things. But it's a reminder. On Friday, we looked at two of them. We said... It is demonstrating the fear of God in the assembly of the righteous. Psalm chapter 89, verse 6 to 7. That we need to practice the fear of God when we are in the house of God. And then we looked at the other one, which is a very strong indicator that there is a fear of God, is that having an attitude of submission. Where we submit to the word of God, we submit to delegated authority, we also submit to each other in the fear of God. So I want us to go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 22 and um, I'm going to read this one. We see um, what it is saying. Deuteronomy 14, 22 and 23. I'm going to request that if we can read it together out and loud, that will be good. Amen. To deal in tear gas. Amen. Hallelujah. Aya. Let's read one, two, three, go. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. Verse 23. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide the tithe of your grain and of your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks that you may learn to fear the Lord, your God, always. Um, basically, it is our attitude and our practice of giving is an indication of the fear of God. But even going very specific, because I'm going to pick two things, according to this scripture, when we give our tithe, we are demonstrating the fear of God. Now that is a, a wide subject because of course we know that there are people who are, are disagreeing with the matter of tithe. And probably you could be here and you don't believe in tithing or probably you are watching and uh, you have a different view of tithing. And that deserves attention on itself. But I can tell you the truth that this principle is very important on matters to do with the fear of God. Sometimes I tend to feel that the reason why God placed a tree in the Garden of Eden, man of God, and he told Adam and Eve, you can eat of every tree that is in the garden, but of that tree you shall not eat. For the day you are going to eat of it, you shall do what? You shall die. Now what was God trying to instill in Adam and Eve? Fear. Yeah. Because if someone tells you the day you eat of this you're going to die. I'm telling you, you're going to be afraid. And um, of course, it doesn't say anything about tithing there, but I always feel the tree in the Garden of Eden carries the principle of the tithe. And this is what I mean. That God gives you a job. So your job is your Garden of Eden. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then in that job, God tells you, of all the income you get, 
you can eat. But please, hey, don't touch the tithe. The tithe belongs to you. I mean to God. So, when I tithe, I'm demonstrating that I fear God. So, conversely, we can also say, a person who doesn't tithe is not walking in the fear of God. There goes now the argument, pastor, that is Old Testament. I mean, uh, we are in the New Testament, the era of grace. Uh, now, let's not go into that because, as I've said, it deserves its own attention. But I can tell you this with authoritatively from the word of God, that the tithe is not an Old Testament principle. The tithe is a divine law that God established on the earth. It did not begin with Moses. It begins way before. Even in the Garden of Eden, you see the principle of the tithe. So when I get the 100% and I remove the tithe and I give to God, I am showing that I fear him. Look at what he says. That you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But that principle goes beyond the tithe. For example, in the book of Acts chapter 10 verse 1, talking about Cornelius, it says something about him in response to his giving. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. Then verse 2 says, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household. Now look at how he expressed the fear of God. Who gave what? Arms generously to the poor and prayed to God always. Of course, it goes without saying that when I pray, I am demonstrating the fear of God. But what I want you to see there is that in, in doing what? Giving arms. So he demonstrated the fear of God by giving arms. Now, what are arms? Arms or giving of arms is where you give to the needy. Okay? Some of you know in the book of Matthew chapter 6, uh, Jesus is talking about giving. He says, when you give, do not let your, uh, your left, is it left or right? Your left hand know what your uh, right hand is giving. And some of you, you have taken that uh, verse. So even when you give your offering, you hide it so much. Have you, have you ever met people who, uh, when they give, uh, and you know, in, I don't know why. Eh? When you are paying, you're paying your, 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 your bus fare, you remove that note respectfully. And sometimes you even want everybody to know that you are paying your fare and, 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 and you give very well. But when you, gi you give your offering, I don't know where that anointing comes from. You fold that thing, it becomes like a ball. <laughs> but then, because your mom told you, don't let your left hand know what you are. So how do you do unakunja and you You see, it is not giving offerings that should be done in secret. It is when you give to the needy. Let me tell you, if you take your offering today from your wallet and come like this to the offering bag, you have not broken scripture. Because that's not alms. That's offering. Alms is when you give to the poor. And why should you do it in secret? So that nobody will dishonor the poor person. It's not about your offering. Oh my God. Praise God. Because if people will see that I am helping this poor person, the dignity of that poor person will be affected. So that's why God says, hide it. Let nobody know that you're helping this person. But as for son, besides the point, the principle there is that in our giving, we demonstrate the fear of God. I want to encourage you, my friends, if you are here today and you don't pay your tithe, please consider your ways. Hallelujah. 
Consider your ways. Begin to pay your tithe. It is not because you have too much to waste. Uh -uh. Even when you don't have enough, learn to pay your tithe. You are demonstrating the fear of God and also you are learning how to fear God in your finances. One of the things I know about tithers is this. If you are a faithful tither, even when God blesses you, you will be responsible with your money. Oh my God. Glory to God. I'm telling you. You get 10,000 and you are faithfully giving 1,000 shillings. What you are learning is how to manage money in the fear of God. When the Lord will give you a million, you, 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 you'll not behave badly. Am I speaking about somebody here? Eh? Uh, let me encourage you because I see today you need encouragement. Before this year is over, I see you na kuona ukinawiri. Hallelujah. But they take it seriously. Anything is that is said here <laughs> is powerful. <laughs> Do you receive that? Look at your neighbor and tell them, I see you prospering in the name of Jesus. Amen? Now, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1, this is a very, very powerful scripture. I'm going to explain it a little bit and then I show you the third one. I think we'll finish with that. The other one will continue later. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Um, this one again, let's read together out and loud. Let's try. One, two, three, go. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The indicator of the fear of God according to scripture is when we demonstrate perfected holiness. You see that? Perfected holiness. Or putting it in simple word, perfect holiness. Can we get into that? Oh my God. Perfect Holiness. Welcome, ma'am. Praise the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Just stay in verse... Uh, oh, that was another version. Now, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, the word perfecting or perfect simply means complete holiness. So that means there is partial holiness, but there is Complete holiness. Now, when I walk in the fear of God, I come into the perfection of holiness. Glory to God. And I think this is a desire of any genuine child of God. That you want to stand before God as holy. Is that about you? You want to stand before God as holy. So, the question, therefore, is to God, what is holiness? That holiness that he considers perfect. Oh, my God. It reminds me of Job, a man who had no imperfection before God. He was perfect. It also reminds me of Abraham. Abraham, one time when God promised him a child, the Bible says it took a while and then Sarah and Abraham began to have a conversation one night. And Sarah told Abraham, um, I think God meant that the son will be yours, but I'm not appearing there. So help yourself. Take my servant and have a child with, with her. The Bible says Abraham ob had obeyed the voice of his wife. Uh, I don't know what happened, but anyway, they got a child. From the time Ishmael was born... If you look at the story of Abraham, God stopped talking to him for some years. The next time God appears to Abraham, he tells Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. What does that mean? Abraham was not perfect before God. Yes, I can be walking with God. I can have some 
levels of purity and righteousness. But what God expects of us is perfect holiness. Oh, thank you, Lord. Now, according to this verse, it says, it is cleansing ourselves. Somebody say, cleansing myself. From the filthiness of the flesh. And then, the filthiness of the spirit. My God. Are you ready for this? It is not just cleansing myself from the filthiness of the flesh, but also the filthiness of the spirit. And I can tell you this, I'm going ahead of myself, that for me to come there, it's going to be a journey. And that journey will be successful depending on my fear of God. Now, what is the journey like? This time, you allow me to use an illustration. Is that okay? Um, I don't know why I'm... Okay. David, come. You, you look good today. Amen? Now, and, and I remember one lunch hour, we talked about this. And I want to repeat, to repeat again so that you can see. Now, David has different layers. Okay? There are different layers in this man, just like in your life. The first layer is what we call the body. Okay? The conduct of the body. That's what it means by the flesh. So you cleanse yourself from the flesh. When you came to Christ, you were told smoking cigarettes is sinful. So you stopped. Taking alcohol is bad. Going to certain places is ungodly. So we taught you what is holiness according to the flesh. And the new believer is striving, struggling, fighting by the grace of God to break patterns of sinful behavior. You see that? So that is cleansing ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh. Now, the, the issue here is this. In as much as that has happened in his life, he's no longer walking in sin, he's no longer practicing sin, it doesn't mean he is in perfect holiness. Mm -mm. So he needs the spirit of the fear of God so that now the spirit of the fear of God can begin to tell him, Hey, David, there is another layer in your life that I want to address. And that is a layer of thoughts and imaginations. So that then, he is not sinning with his body, but the mind is still struggling with sin, sinful thoughts. That's why Jesus, for example, said in Matthew chapter 5, you have, you've heard, do not uh, kill your brother. Sin you? But then Jesus says, but I say unto you, whoever hates his brother for no reason is a murderer. Why? He has not killed his brother physically, but he has killed him in his mind. Mm. Oh God. So the spirit of the fear of God begins to expose in this man the thought patterns of his life. When he is alone, what does he think about? What does he muse about? What does he meditate about? Now that is a layer in his life where the spirit of God must work. And then you realize when you, you move from the place of thoughts and imaginations, the Lord is beginning to work on that. He goes to a third layer. And that is the layer of attitudes. And he says, now, perfect holiness in your attitude. So sometimes the Holy Spirit begins to show you, hey, um, you have never forgiven so and so. But, but, but you know, uh, God, uh, he offended me. Uh, for, 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 uh, forgive him. And then you remember what uh, 
the first president said, and you try to argue with God. God, even our first president said, we will forgive and we will never forget. So I can't forget that. The Lord tells you, ah, there's a problem with your attitude. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit begins to address areas of pride and arrogance in my attitude. That is a layer in him that the fear of God is working on. Then when the attitudes are being handled and God is dealing with your attitude, and let me tell you, for, our, for your attitude to be perfected in holiness, it takes the grace of God. It takes the grace of God. And it takes a high level of brokenness to allow the light of God to illuminate your attitude. Oh, glory to God. Those of you who are married, you may have all the reasons to convince God that you married the wrong woman. And then the Holy Spirit begins to, to shed light on your attitude and say, no, your attitude toward your wife is wrong. Mm. Glory to God. It takes a lot of brokenness. And I pray in the name of Jesus that we are going to allow the spirit of the fear of God to enter into the trenches of our soul. Ah. The trenches of my soul and begin to enlighten the filthiness in my inner being so that by his grace, God can work on me. Let me tell you, it is a journey. But it's a journey of grace. Glory to God. And then now we come to the fourth layer in a man. It is called spirit. Now, your spirit and my spirit can be filthy. Okay. Can I go deeper? Or should I finish you? Go deeper. When we define salvation, many times we say, your spirit was saved. Your soul is being saved and your body will be saved. Okay? Your spirit, soul, and body. And it is believed that your spirit as a child of God is sinless. Can you see that? Now, I, I, I want to emphasize on a very important point here. Please don't miss this. This hour. When Christ comes into your heart, he sanctifies your spirit and he makes it holy. That is why if someone is born again and for any reason they die on the spot, they will go to heaven. Because their spirit has been born again. Alright? And it has been sanctified. But here Paul is saying that in as much as my spirit is sanctified, it can also be filthy if I'm not careful. Now, notice here he's not talking to sinners. He's talking to the children of God, those who are born again. And he's saying, cleanse yourself from the filthiness of spirit. And the word in Greek is pneuma, not suke. Suke is the soul, the mind. Pneuma is the inner man that is sanctified when someone comes to Christ. But Paul says, yes, it is true, but it is possible to allow filthiness to affect the spirit. And one time I was asking the Lord, how is it that my spirit can be filthy? He said, by having wrong motives. You can do the right thing with the wrong motive. It is a sin of the spirit. Oh my God. Thank you, David. I feel like giving an example so that Tushike, Sinisawa, I can hold the mic and preach the word. How many of you know 
That is a good thing. But as I preach, I'm looking at Pastor Chagala na macho ya kona. And in my heart, I'm saying, you see how a good preacher that I am. I am better than you. So I'm trying to outshine him as I preach. So what is wrong there? Not what I am doing, but the reason why I'm doing it. Mm. You can hold the mic to lead worship. And uh, <laughs> the worship leader forgot you. Kabsa, you have never been given an opportunity to lead worship. You're always doing backup. And then that Sunday you are told, my sister, you are the one in charge. So that day you come ready to prove to all these worship leaders you have been playing games. Now the woman of God of the hour has arrived. So when you are leading people in worship in your attitude, no, in your motive is not about worshiping God. You are trying to outshine the others. And I can tell you these pastors, this is one of the reasons why region are shut up in the spirit. God help me. Time is up. A man of God is sent to a city. You come to that city. You start a church. And you say the church is revival is here international. All the other ministers and the other churches that have been there before, eh, you, you, are, you are doing rehearsals. Nimimi nimefika. I am the man of the hour. And I can tell you, many ministers carry that attitude as they serve God. And that brings in a blockage in the spirit because now our spirits are filthy before God. So when Paul is saying perfecting holiness. It means not just being holy in your conduct. Not just being holy in your thoughts and imaginations and in your attitude. But more importantly, to ensure you are holy in your motives. Why do you do the things that you do? And let me tell you this. The spirit of the fear of God. The spirit of the fear of God will not leave you alone if there is any filthiness in your spirit. He will shed light on it. And let me tell you, my friends, many times, and I admit this faithfully before God, many times I have preached. And after preaching, I go back and the Holy Spirit is on my case. It says, you, why did you do what you did? Why did you say what you said? It's not shame. It's not personal shame. It's not self-consciousness. Areas that as I was ministering, my motive was not right. My attitude was not right. Yes, preaching the word of God, but the Holy Spirit is saying, no, that was wrong. That was sinful. Now that's a Christian life. And that's why we need the fear of God. So that we can come into perfect holiness. Is it making sense? All right. May God help us. Can you lift your hand just as you are sitting down and say, Lord, release again the spirit of the fear of God. Just pray that prayer. Just pray that prayer. Release again the spirit of the fear of God in my heart. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I want to walk in the fear of God, in your fear, in fearing you, in honoring you, in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh my God. You know, I, I really sense that there are people here right now, you're under very heavy conviction. The Holy Spirit is beginning to show you areas in your life where he's saying, this one, I want to change. This one, you need to change. And I want to ask you, comply. Don't feel like you are falling under the spirit of legalism. No, 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 no. As long as the Holy Spirit highlighting these things to you, respond. 
And let me tell you, the heavens will open over your life. Buenas sana. And I really hope I've been able to communicate in a small way this matter that is so important. This day in the evening from 5.30, we are going to gather here for the miracle service. And I want to ask you, please don't fail to come. If God helps us, we are going to continue with the same message. Indicators of the fear of God. And then we see how we are going to move forward all the way to Friday. Let's stand up on our feet even as I invite the worship team to come. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we have spoken your word. We pray now. May you take your word and perform it in our hearts.